Folks, I wanted to put this um, particular theme in this weekend because it is a sort of uh, recapitulation. It was sort of gathering up a lot of stuff that we've we've talked about. You've already seen how how um, you get these uh, recurring themes, and so it's good to bring this idea of authority to the fore because uh, a lot of what makes uh, Anglicanism distinctive is is how uh, authority works in Anglicanism. Uh, what is it that we talk about when we're talking about authority? Uh, Stephen Sykes uh, points out that we use terms like authority and power vaguely and often in interchangeably, and it's not easy to actually define it. Um, there's a sort of there's a lack of precision even in Scripture, where um, often. Um, the word exousia, which we often translate as authority, is uh, still sometimes translated as power. Um, but for the most part, um, the, the scriptures makes this distinction between what you might call authority, which is more internal, and power, which is more external. And so, um, it says in Mark 1, 22, Jesus taught unlike the scribes because he taught with authority. It's that uh, in, inner thing. Um, Avis gives us a definition of, a, of uh, power as the capacity to obtain compliance, whereas authority is a form of power where compliance tends to be given. And a good example of that is um, uh, this little exchange. Authority is uh, is that uh, presence that uh, that to which we respond and and we give uh, uh, we give permission to the other. The uh, Reformation affirmed um, the Reformation was about authority to a large extent. So uh, was the Pope the ultimate authority? A key point of the Reformation, as we've just been hearing, is that the Reformers affirmed the primary authority of Scripture and that authority working immediately, not mediated through the people of God, not working through a clerical hierarchy, but working directly amongst the people of God. And for that reason, the Bible was placed in the church. It was read in vernacular, and Scripture was it was maintained that Scripture had sufficient perspicuity or clarity <coughs> to ensure that the ordinary person could grasp its fundamental message of salvation. And so, it's characteristic of the Reformation tradition that it operates. Uh, with a dialectic or, or polarity of the word and the church. So in the um, pre-Reformation church, there was the assumption that the word agreed with the church. But the reformers um, uh, held this polarity in which the church could be addressed by the word. The word of God in scripture reigned for them over the visible church the institutional church, and, and the church was continually in dialogue with Scripture as to who it ought to be, or what it ought to be. Uh, some words from Stephen Spencer. He says, Here is a startling inversion of the authority of church and Scripture. The church was now given a subservient role in the economy of salvation. The church had no right to go against the word of Scripture, as Article 19 makes clear. The church hath power, church hath power, to decree rites and ceremonies and authority in controversies of faith and yet it is not lawful for the church to ordain anything contrary to God's word. Uh, that's a terrific summary of what the Reformation was about, is how authority worked in the church. In giving primacy to scripture, the English reformers did not follow some of their continental uh, counterparts in seeking that scripture would dictate all elements of church life, rather the emphasis was more uh, focused on, the, on what I call the directedness of scripture, which is towards salvation. So um, 
scripture was uh, sufficient for salvation. So Hooker points, a lovely quote from Hooker picking up that which I talked about earlier when, it, when he gave the example of the Trinity and some of you spoke to me about that at lunch. He says this, uh, our belief in the Trinity, the co-eternity of the Son of God with his Father, the proceeding of the Spirit, these with such other principal points, the necessity whereof none is denied, no one's denying the Trinity, uh, notwithstanding in Scripture, nowhere to be found by express literal mention. It's not saying they're nowhere to be found. You can infer them from Scripture, but they are not found by express literal mention. And so the elevation of Scripture acted as a limiter on clerical authority in that, again quoting the articles, whatsoever is not read therein nor may be proved thereby is not required of any man. So, there was a, so the authority was used as, to bring a gift of freedom as well, uh, as a limiter on, uh, on, uh, on ecclesiastical authority. For the English reformers, um, authority worked through scripture, through the whole. Um, authority was shared. The principle of conciliarity was taken up at the Reformation. As John Jewell said, God grant that we may one day see that a general council may be called where Christ may sit as president and these matters that are now in question may have indifferent hearing and may be decided by the word of God so that even the councils had to have a relationship to scripture. And uh, you've heard me say in the last lecture that Jewell goes on to make the point though that conciliarity wasn't just at the councils they saw it as a working principle of the Reformation. So uh, Jewell could insist that the English Reformation was conciliar. And he says, it had not been conducted without councils, assemblies, conferences of learned men, particularly in Parliament and Convocation. And uh, again, Hooker held to that basic principle of authority that's articulated in the uh, conciliar tradition, uh, which is that... Um, the quote from Hooker, the power of governance is vested in the whole body and that consent is necessary for its exercise in matters either temporal or spiritual. And the other observation we might make about conciliarity is that often uh, it can be valid even when uh, it can't be enforced. What do I mean? Um, well, it means that often decisions can be reached uh, or, or outcomes can be reached through conciliar process and they will gain their own authority. Authority is not always formal in the church. You know, things, things gain authority by, by uh, and we'll come to this later more, but by what, how the church receives them. Well, we talk about something called reception. And the church... For instance, a good example of, is one that we've referred to a number of times this weekend. We've given a particular place uh, to the Chicago Lambeth Quadrilateral in Anglicanism. Now, that's, that was simply a recommendation of the Lambeth Conference in regard to uh, the reunion of the church uh, with um, other denominations. However, um, it's gained a particular uh, authority in Anglicanism, which is an informal authority. So it's, it's important to remember that authority often is um, something that works in a number of ways. So, so shared authority, the shared authority of monarch and bishops, but later shared authority in Anglicanism is reflected in synods and other gatherings. In, in uh, synods you've got the three houses, so you have a, you have a vertical sharing as well. So authority shared authority dispersed. Stephen Sykes and a fellow called Ephraim Radner have separately argued that the characteristic notion of dispersed authority means that in Anglican that, that, that permeates all levels of, of being the church. Um, for Anglicans, authority is not just dispersed through various agencies and instruments, 
but operates through the faithful as a whole as the word of God is heard, read in their midst. So um, Sykes said this, it is of the essence of the Anglican view of authority that the means of judging matters are in the hands of the whole people of God. Again, um, we've got the example of Synod. Three houses, clergy, laity, bishop. Uh, we have clergy and parish councils. And we, if those of you who are looking to ordination, you make a commitment to uphold that system uh, in the oaths and declarations. This shared accountability of, uh, of uh, bishop, clergy and lay people. So for Anglicanism, uh, authority is, is uh, shared and mutuality of accountability is a fundamental of our system. It's as old as the communion itself, this emphasis on dis dispersed authority. Once we begin to think about, about uh, not just the Church of England, but as we start to come forward and start to talk about the Anglican communion, and we're moving therefore into um, uh, later years, um, as the Church of England spread to the New World, the American War of Independence meant that no simple extension of jurisdiction of the Church of England was possible. And we've talked earlier about the fact that um, by 1852 there's widespread agreement among the bishops in Australia, Canada, New Zealand and South Africa that colonial churches needed freedom from English ecclesiastical legislation. In fact, more to the point, and there was a letter from uh, Gladstone to Bishop Short in Adelaide saying he had reached the view um, that the churches in the colonies uh, existed by mutual consent. So that meant that they began to uh, produce uh, uh, their own instruments of authority in each church. So authority, uh, there was this historical movement that dispersed authority in the communion. It wasn't the beginning of dispersed authority, but something which uh, was rather intrinsic to Anglicanism or to the Church of England by the time found new expression at the time the Anglican Communion developed uh, and, the, and the Church of the Communion existed together in an arrangement of dispersed authority. The first uh, example of um, that being exercised collegially was the Lambeth Conference. Uh, and we talked a bit about that where there was this push for um, some form of gathering of Anglicans from across the world finding themselves in a situation where they were aware um, that they had become a family of churches around the world, but were not c confident that they knew how they related to each other. And there was a big debate about that. Uh, would we be a church that had a patriarch? Would, be, would we be a church, one church with a patriarch? Would we be a church that uh, could make uh, decisions through a general council of Anglicans. They called it for a pan-Anglican council or synod. You know, um, then we could have done what the Bishop uh, Jonathan suggested and we would have just referred our, our, our troubles to that one council and all would be resolved until another problem popped up with the week later. But what happened, um, as we know, was that the Archbishop, Archbishop Longley, um, called a conference, not a council. And he called it at Lambeth, and it was there as a deliberative, consultative gathering. We ended up uh, with, a, with a communion of churches, with each national church autonomous, and, and authority therefore dispersed uh, in terms of the structure of our communion. There's one bloke in that photo who hasn't taken his hat off. <laughs> um, why is it, might I ask, being slightly cheeky and, and, uh, and being under the jurisdiction of the Archbishop while I'm here, why is it that Philip Aspinall would notice these things? <laughs> There's a fellow with his hat on. <laughs>
Oh, I can see that. All the others are holding their hats. I can you. see that. Yes. He might have been in balls and his head was cold. Maybe he hadn't got his hair that day. Well, um, that, e that demonstrates entirely um, the diversity and unity of the Anglican community. It's almost funny in the crowd. We've referred already to the Chicago Lambeth Quadrilateral, um, and this is Lambeth 1888, sorry, excuse my typo. Um, but, but I want to trace some of the Lambeth uh, statements on authority. Um, and we, we've seen it as a statement so far of Anglican identity. But I want you to also consider it as a, a statement of how Anglicans understand that authority works in the church. That is, that the, uh, that the authority of God addresses the church directly through some instruments. The authority of God directs, direct, addresses the church through some instruments. And these are... Uh, those that are listed there. First of all, Holy Scripture, as containing all things necessary to salvation and as being the rule and ultimate standard of faith. Then, the Apostles and Nicene Creeds as a sufficient statement of the Christian faith. The two sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper ministered with the unfailing use of Christ's words of institution and of the elements ordained by him and the historic episcopate. Uh, so, so not only was that a good summary of some of the distinctive of, distinctives of things that are important to Anglicans, it's a fair summary of how Anglicans have understood that uh, God's authority addresses us directly as a church. Aren't they part of the 39 articles? The, what was just said there? Like the Holy Scriptures of the Old and New Testament? Yeah, they're, they're drawing on the articles. The articles yeah. They're using some of the language of the articles. Yeah. That's, that's absolutely correct. In that, in that sense, you've got the, the, the authority of God in, has a dispersed nature vertically, as well as an instrumental. It was, only re, it was really later that we had great, more emphasis on, on, on authority and structure. So the land of quadrilateral was 1888? 18, yeah, 1888. Yeah, that was, sorry, that was my typo. So authority is dispersed. Authority is exercised in, in a synod. Synodality is a phrase that's used. They were developed in the Anglican Communion during the latter part of the 19th century. Australia was a major contributor to their development, by the way. I like to remind the Poms of that. <laughs> they reflected an earlier emphasis on the conciliar idea that I've talked about, that, that um, authority works for the whole people of God with the instrument of consent. The characteristic model of Anglican governance now is often described as the bishop in synod. Bishop in synod. Meaning that a diocese is governed by a bishop acting with the advice of and consent of representatives of the clergy and laity of the diocese. I don't know what you call it here, but often the bishops, the standing committee of the synod is often called a bishop in council. The idea of that it's a conciliar thing. Synods operate generally through the principle of consent. In one form or another, both bishops and synod must give permission for something to proceed. So for Anglicans, this conciliar tradition this idea of authority acting in, in synodality, uh, one way or another, is an important at aspect of how we understand synod. Not that that means that we don't also have, a, a, an, uh, have the sense of authority in primacy sometimes, or in episcopal leadership. And Avis says this, Anglican polity embodies a principle of, again, primacy as well as synodality. So, as Anglicans, we are Anglicans, part of what's, what says to us we are Anglicans is we are in communion with the Archbishop of Canterbury. That's a, there's a primatial function there that, that helps define our identity. And of course, primacy is exercised in each of the churches of the communion. Although I might say, when you compare what we call primacy with what uh, 
say, the Roman Catholic Church calls primacy. Ours, ours is a mini minor compared with a Mack truck. <laughs> you know, the primate in most of our churches does not act with a level of uh, power uh, that uh, you might see in, 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 uh, in the Roman Catholic Church with the, with the Pope. It's, a, it's, a, it's a largely uh, a pastoral primacy. And of course, more recently, the primates meeting is another exercise of primacy. So, so synodality, but also primacy. But it's a it's a primacy um, that is um, it's a restrained primacy in Anglicanism. Primacy and episcopacy. Bishop uh, Archbishop Philip talked about the fact that there was a shift at the Reformation from ju uh, jurisdictional episcopacy more towards pastoral episcopacy. The bishops were pastors and sh they were shepherds and teachers. Not that they didn't have some jurisdiction, but the emphasis shifted towards pastoral and teaching. And that's reflected in the language of the ordinal. Also, the bishop was a bishop in collegial relationship. So we talk about convocation in the English church was when the bishops gathered together in a, in, in a as it were, in concilia a gathering. And when you see uh, your archbishop in those red and black robes uh, that some people call blood and bandages, <laughs> you, know, it's a, you know the red and black ones? No mitre, red and black. That's the, they were the robes of the convocation. That's a total throwaway line. Um, but there, there was a sense of episcopacy being both personal and collegial. It's personal oversight, it's also collegial oversight. So in the Australian church we have a house of bishops. Um, and for, we do actually meet sometimes, or the, the house of bishops does, house of bishops do meet sometimes, there's a bishops meeting each year. So episcopacy, authority in episcopacy, but episcopacy in a certain model, which is pastoral teaching, it's collegial, it's personal, um, and, and it relates back to uh, the life of the diocese, so that perhaps the appropriate governance model, as I said, is the bishop in, not the bishop above, the bishop in, bishop in synod. So we come to Lambeth 48, and we talk about authority there. And the Lambeth Conference of 1948 says, authority in Anglicanism is understood as singular and plural. And while singular, it's, dis it's also distributed. So it's singular because God is singular. It is singular because it derives from a single divine source reflected in the richness and historicity of the divine revelation the authority of God, the Holy Trinity. However, while singular, it said, that 48, uh, 48 Lambeth, it says, it's distributed, and I'm not going to talk about meetings and things here, but it's distributed among scripture, tradition, creeds, the ministry of the word and sacraments, the witness of the saints, and the consensus, consensus for dalium, the mind of the people of God. So all those things are ways that the single authority of God works, it said, at Lambeth 48, through the people of God. So it says, it's thus a dispersed rather than a centralised authority, having many elements which combine and interact and check each other. These elements, at their best, the Lambeth 48 conference says, at their best, these elements... Uh, contribute to a process of mutual support, <coughs> mutual checking, redressing of errors or exaggerations, and contribute to the many-sided fullness of the authority which Christ has committed to his church. Uh, now that's absolutely Anglicanism at its best. Uh, at, it, at its worst, we end up in um, major roadblocks and, and people trying to win, as, as Archbishop Philip said. But that's, that's a terrific statement, Lambeth 48, of how authority works in Anglicanism. <coughs>
kicking forward 20 years, Lambeth, 1968, talked about spiritual authority as what was, they used the phrase, authority is ordered liberty. And there are three strands. The first being scripture proclaimed in the Catholic creeds set in their context of the baptismal confession. Again, um, Archbishop Philip talked about the continuity of the Catholic stream in our church. Um, patristic reason and conciliar decision. The second is the church's witness to its own truth through its historic formularies. The third, this is a, this is a distinctive uh, that's coming out at 68, is that the church, there is a contemporary authority it said, which is the church's own proclamation. The church is continuing witness to the Christian church, truth through uh, Christian truth through preaching, worship, and the writings of scholars and teachers. So again, you, you remember we talked about how Anglicanism gives particular space for uh, scholarship, for the for reason, and here it's in '68. It's being recognised as uh, part of the church's continuing witness to the truth um, through the writings of scholars and teachers and quote not least as exercised in historical and philosophical inquiry as well as in the claims it says of pastoral care forward to the next Lambeth conference and we begin uh, with Lambeth's uh, 78 and 88 uh, were conducted against the background of controversies around the ordination of women. And the Lambeth conferences of 1978 uh, had to address, uh, 78 and 88, address the issues of authority in that context. What began to be, to emerge out of 1978 and 88 uh, was um, that the acknowledgement that the communion uh, needed not just those other ways that authority worked, but they gave structure to them with um, particular bodies of consultation and decision making. These embodiment of agents of unity included the Archbishop of Canterbury, the Lambeth Conference, the Anglican Consultative Council, which had come into being by this stage, and then um, around this time the Primates Meeting, was also acknowledged as uh, one of the instruments of communion whereby um, God uh, might, the authority of God might work through the church. Not in, not in a way that um, made binding decisions, but in the way that we were able to uh, give advice in the bonds of affection to each other. Remember what I said, that authority does not always work through binding decision, it can work through influence as well. Now, if you look at the Lambeth Conference, there are some resolutions of the Lambeth Conference, and I've given you the example of the 1988 Lambeth Quadrilateral, who sort of assume their own authority because um, the church has received them as wise, uh, and so they've gained this authority in the church. Authority is not limited uh, to, to binding juridical uh, power, authority often can be uh, given through the consensus fidelium. People say, this, this is good, this is worthy. Coming forward another decade um, really brings us to a, to a crisis point in regard to authority in Anglicanism. The 98 Lambeth Conference and uh, boy bishops like uh, Philip Aspinall of few days in Episcopacy were there and I was not even a twinkle in an Episcopal eye at that stage. Um, but the Lambeth Conference of 98 uh, began, uh, I suppose it was the beginning of a, of a deep divide in Anglicanism around issues of human sexuality. And also the, the, some of the intention, some of the cultural tensions in Anglicanism uh, a post-colonial Anglicanism started to emerge with the, dom the growth of the uh, uh, numbers from places like Africa and, and a willingness, as um, some scholars have pointed out, uh, for that 
those parts of the developing world to begin to speak back to the West. So what we had um, in 98 was a response to these tensions with the affirmation of what was called a web of structure. In particular, the Office of the Archbishop of Canterbury, the Lambeth Conference, the Consultative Council, and a regular meeting of primates. And much of the Virginia report is devoted to asking how the function of these uh, communion structures can be clarified and possibly strengthened. Lambeth 19, 1998 called for, quote, enhanced responsibility for the primates meeting, including a possible role of intervention in cases of exceptional emergency. Yeah, that sounds a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, and urge a clearer integration of the roles of the Anglican Consultative Council and the Primates Meeting. Very little of that actually happened, but there was a closer relationship between the ACC and the Primates Meeting that has been carried through. In October 2003, following, the, uh, a, number of, following a number of events, uh, which included the, uh, the confirmation of the election of uh, a partnered gay bishop in the US, the um, promulgation and authorisation of a right of blessing for same-sex marriage in New Westminster in Canada, and, not to be forgotten, the intervention by some bishops in Africa by way of uh, in, in intervening in the affairs of the province, province uh, of an international church in America. All of those things uh, put immense pressure on, on the bonds of affection of the Anglican Communion and the Archbishop of Canterbury responded in October 2003 by appointing something called the Lambeth Commission on Communion. And I won't go into it in great detail, but it does a number of things. It has a theological prologue uh, which um, talks about diversity and unity in, in the church based on the doctrine of the Trinity. But then it puts an emphasis on the four instruments of unity as it described them, instruments of unity uh, and made recommendations about them which basically are that they be strengthened. So the Archbishop of Canterbury was to be given authority to articulate the mind of the communion in matters of controversy and to speak directly to any provincial or that is to any national church on behalf of the communion. And a council of advice was to be composed of suitable persons to provide for support to the Archbishop as he or she um, did that. And to give, the to give more authority to the um, Archbishop of Canterbury in addressing concerns in the communion. Besides that, the, there was a draft covenant that not only provided that the instruments of unity determine what issues could be dealt with at communion level and what didn't matter, what were adiaphora, but it also gave these instruments some sort of coercive or semi-juridical power to step in and resolve difficult issues in national churches. They, this was really a, a, a move to resolve the tensions in Anglicanism uh, by greater centralisation uh, for authority to be somewhat centralised. Um, it's probably fair to say that, that those proposals were not greeted well. The need was understood, but there was a, cons a very uh, significant negative response throughout the communion. And uh, both, I think, uh, Archbishop Philip and I were both part of a working group for the Australian Church uh, where we said that we didn't think it would work and it was unrealistic and we were concerned that it supported a centralised jurisdiction in Anglicanism. It was a shift from this vision of dispersed authority and that Australia would be unlikely to make a statement of commitment uh, to an interdependent of life of the communion which compromised provincial or national autonomy. I would argue that later drafts of the uh, covenant largely addressed these concerns, 
But the reason I, I, I've, I've traced this issue about authority through to today really is to help you understand just how much we were shaped by these debates at the Reformation and how much those threads weave their way into your life today. Um, you, in your involvement in the church, will face these issues of authority and division in Anglicanism and in the Anglican Church of Australia. Um, these, are, these are threads that come to us from before the Reformation. And the issue of, a, of authority and how it works in Ang Anglicanism has been characteristic of who we are as a church. Um, we've existed oh. as a church by holding tensions and we've resisted the continual temptation to resolve tensions, to resolve them in one direction or another. Is that workable in the long term? Is it a gift? Uh, I want to suggest it is. I want to suggest there's some, there's some real gifts in it, but some real risk as well. So over the last three decades, there's been a major shift in Anglicanism, I would say, from, from those instruments of primary authority that the Lambeth <coughs> Conference of 1948 identified. Uh, we put much more uh, more emphasis on structural authority in recent times. Um, yet in a communion of autonomous churches, those structures actually have limited coercive authority. They can't decide anything. So there's a deep dissonance in modern Anglicanism, a deep conflict. And the idea of conciliarity is that what touches the whole should in some sense be decided by the whole, but at a communion level we can't decide. We don't have, we don't have the capacity to decide. Well, let's um, look at a summary and then I'm going to conclude by reading something to you. Particularly since the Reformation, the Church of England operated by maintaining a, a sense of the primary authority of God's word working through the whole people of God in a number of ways. And that sense of God's word working was primarily scripture, but wasn't only. We understood God's word coming to us through uh, the application of human reason, through, through the tradition, through the primitive church. The authority was shared it wasn't singular, it was shared and checked. It was synodal with Episcopal leadership, the Crown and Parliament. Had a principle of working conciliarity was carried forward one way or another into each of the, dec each of the decades of Anglicanism. You can see it expressed. And whether it's through the accident of history or through conviction as the communion involved, uh, we have a church that now has a model of dispersed authority. I don't think it was just accident. I think there was some, there was some thinking um, as, as history and thought, history and reflection interacted. That's how we Anglicans often do theology. Circumstance and reflection produced this model of dispersed authority that we call the Anglican Communion. <coughs> There's a lot of pressure on us today to modify that. I, I want to... Um, conclude with uh, the questions, with, with some reflections which I gather uh, up from, from this little book that I put out a few years ago. And it's this, that um, what's at stake in any ecclesiology is human life and what it means to live together. We are, to quote the Windsor Report, as it were, a, a colony of the kingdom on planet Earth. So I say these things. I'll read them to you as a way of bringing our weekend to a conclusion, and then Jonathan might lead us in a prayer if I might ask you, Bishop Jonathan. In the end, if ecclesiology is to be authentic, it must ultimately be about God and the world, about being human, about community. <coughs> 
about the new human venture launched upon the world in Christ. If the call of the church is to say something about the intentions of God to the world, it must image the usness of God to a world given to Babel-like divisions. The people of God are to show a likeness of God whose oneness is community without coercion to a world where oneness is often forced by dominance. If our ever-shrinking, pluralist, diverse and radicalised world, in our ever-shrinking, pluralist, diverse and radicalised world, what might it take for humans to joyfully give to others the space of difference? In a world of fragile resources and the ever-present risk of conflict over those resources, what might it take for humanity to, ha to handle conflict without destruction? In a world where the great powers inevitably come to dominate and impose their cultures, what might it take for minority cultures to be protected and even treasured? To suggest that in the church a new way of being human has been launched upon the world is to accept the responsibility of being part of the answers to questions like these, or at least to be part of the conversation. This should not be understood in an arrogant way through which the church feels entitled to deliver its answer to the world's woes, but as John A.T. Robinson suggested some decades ago, it's not unhelpful for the church to see itself as the rudder by which God steers the course of history when so often it is much more like a cork bobbing about in the wake of power seemingly greater than itself. In looking at a series of Anglican Communion reports and comments, this brief study has sought to look forward and offer some suggestions about the developing of Anglican, Anglicanism's polity of persuasion. Um, our suggestion, I'll, I'll go on, but I'll, 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 I'll conclude with these words. All that, all that, all those questions. This is why the sometimes tedious debates about authority and structure in the Anglican Communion might actually matter because it's about what humanity on planet earth might look like and that's a good reason to study ecclesiology I might say so thank you everyone thank you.